My name is Terrence Barkin. I'm the Executive Director of the Graphene Council, and we are hosting today's webinar on graphene oxide materials, production methods, and applications. We are going to hear from two experts in this field. The first is Stephanie Santos, representing Avalonics, and the second is Caio Losardo, who represents Vino Materials. So with that, Stephanie, I would encourage you, please go ahead and share your screen and open your mic, and we'll get started with today's Hi. webinar. Thank you, Terence. Hi, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, so yes, as Terence said, I'm here to talk about graphene oxide production and applications. And first, here's the outline of my presentation. Um, I want to introduce ourselves first. Then I want to talk about some difference between graphene and graphene oxide, uh, give you some geocratization, stability, applications, production. And then I want to talk about some requirements that we feel uh, the industry has for us as suppliers. And then just some closing remarks. So about the balonics, we are uh, Europe's largest producer of GEO and RGO. We are located in Norway. And our ambition is to become a world-class uh, certified suppliers for the graphene industry. Uh, and for that, we have the competitive advantage that uh, our production method is safe and scalable. Now, some differences between graphene oxide and graphene. On uh, this side of the slide, we see the typical graphene sheet, uh, all carbon, very well aligned hexagonal lattice. This material is uh, conductive. It is not charged in the surface and it's an hydrophobic material. On the other hand, we have graphene oxide, which is the same uh, carbon-based, but it is decorated in the surface and on the edges with functional groups uh, of oxygen. Uh, carbonyl, hydroxyl, uh, carboxylic, and epoxide. Uh, these groups give the material a, a charred surface, and then it's an insulating material, and it gives uh, a very interesting property, which is this amphiphilicity. Uh, this amphiphilic nature of the material becomes it, uh, makes it a very versatile material. Why? Because then it can be dispersed in a wide range of sol solvents. And after you have uh, the, the material fully dispersed, you can uh, introduce it uh, and adapt it to formulation and then applications. So graphene oxide. Here I am showing you some SEM images of graphene oxide. Uh, these images are taken in bulk materials. So you cannot see here single sheets of graphene oxide, but you can see already the sharp edges of this material. And here in the AFM image uh, of geo taken on silicon uh, wafer, there you can see a single layer of graphene oxide. The average thickness of this material is uh, one nanometer and the flake size is between one and two micrometers. So uh, now I want to talk about the stability of this material. Uh, I have shown you this uh, diagram before. So here we have the graphene, uh, the graphene oxide. And we know that we're adding energy to the graphite to get this graphene oxide. But then what happens after that? It's been suggested that spontaneous changes happen in the surface of the material, making this compound a metastable one. Um, so, and we also know that the energy barriers of these changes are not well defined. And why am I telling you this? Because then producing, storing, shipping, and working with a metastable material requires knowledge good knowledge about the changes that can happen uh, under different environments. So what we did was to start uh, some preliminary studies in stability. Uh, we took three samples that we had in storage from 2012, 2015, and 2018 uh, that we knew that uh, were kept in a cool and dark place and, make, uh, and made uh, um, stable dispersions from these uh, materials. And these are the results, the preliminary ones. Uh, to the naked eye, it is very easy to see that something is happening. I, let me see if I can get the pointer. 
uh, here. Uh, just so to the naked eye, it is very easy to see that there are changes happening in the material. So what we did was, uh, and we suspect that's some kind of reduction. Uh, so we took an XRD and here we have it. We can see uh, some change in the interlayer distance uh, due to what we suspect some possibly rearrangement of the functional groups. And actually there are studies that suggest that uh, these changes happen between 30 and 40 days after the material has been produced. And that one of the main changes that happened in the material is that the epoxide in the surface starts to interact with adjacent uh, hydrogen from the material itself or from the atmosphere and uh, to form uh, water molecules. These water molecules can be intercalated between the sheets and then it's one of the hypotheses of why we have this uh, change in the interlayer distance. So of course we need further research on this. <coughs> Sorry. So what we did was stored under three different conditions, minus 18 room temperature and cool room. And then uh, we're going to take a look at this, these samples, uh, run full characterization, and this is to be monitored with a long-term perspective. So I will be happy to show you the results when we have them. And now applications of GEO. Uh, today I want to discuss in particular six applications. So let's just get started. Corrosion protection. We are familiarized with, with uh, corrosion and what it can do. Uh, in, have you ever seen this article? It was published by Nature in 2014. And uh, they just threw out the question in the air. Is geo really the end of rust? Since that, uh, there have been several report and pundit applications uh, suggesting that geo in combination with zinc or other metals can protect auto parts from rusting. And now, uh, Provexa in Sweden, in collaboration with Chalmers University, have developed a coating to, um, to protect uh, moving auto parts in Scania trucks. And I am very proud to say that they are using our material for this work. Uh, they are already in test fields. So this is not theoretical anymore. This works. Now, uh, one of the largest fields, uh, reinfor reinforced composites and coatings. Here I'm just going to take two examples, which is RGO um, for um, <coughs> sea, sea moving vessels. And also uh, something that was very interesting for us to work with. This image right here is uh, glass fibers coated first with GEO because it was easier to make the, the coating in an aqueous uh, media. And after that, what we did was reducing these, um, these glass fibers or, or these geo already coated in the fibers. And this is what we got, uh, our geo coated glass fibers. Remember that geo has a very large specific surface area. So with only one gram of this material, you can coat 800 square meters of surface. So these can be incorporated into different materials and even cement. Now, some sports equipment. I'm just taking two, two examples here from uh, our Nordic uh, countries. And the other one I hope you're familiarized with, it is uh, track shoes that are being developed at Manchester University, uh, University by a group of scientists. And what, uh, what they are doing is incorporating these graphene materials into the rubber of the shoes to make it stronger, more durable, and give it uh, a better uh, and improved grip. So, very exciting. Now, uh, energy storage. There is a company here in, in, in Norway, uh, Moro Batteries, working with our graphene oxide that has encountered these uh, challenges of electronic conductivity, polysulfide sh shuttle, 
and energy density. And they are addressing these challenges by combining uh, geo and RGO to improve the cathode, uh, improve the thickness, and give the electrolytes some pretreatment that overall will give the battery itself a better performance. And now, one of my favorite ones, loudspeakers membranes. GEO has been called as the holy grail of materials for this kind of application. Why? Because it is light, it is stiff, and it provides damping. These three properties translate into a better sound of quality, higher volumes without distortion, and a longer battery life. And so the end, we are very proud to say that this application is also being, sorry, this is not an application, this is a product that is being developed right now by Aura Graphene Audio in Montreal uh, with, our G, uh, with our GEO. And we're very proud that they are our partners, just, so just keep an eye on this one. Another very important one, water treatment. Uh, a few years ago, I was in a conference, in a graphene conference in Barcelona, and I was talking to a colleague. And uh, he said that, okay, today our talk is basically energy, energy fuels, and how do we get it, and how to improve it, how do we store it. I believe tomorrow we will be speaking about water. If I may add, it's clean water. And then uh, even a bit more worry, I think that tomorrow is catching up with us already. So we have developed in Avalonics a cleanup system for separation of heavy metals and radionuclides for contaminated, from contaminated uh, equal solutions. This system is based on our graphene oxide and in combination with an inorganic flocculating agent that we have also developed in-house. The advantages of this um, method is that it's a cost-effective te technology it works in even at low temperatures, very important for the Nordic countries. It shows fast adsorption kinetics, and it shows a very uh, effective high, uh, separation. Uh, and here, I'm not going to go into deep into these results, but we're getting very good results. If you're curious about this, please drop me an email. Now, graphene oxide production. Whenever we think about graphene oxide production, the next thing that goes into our minds is Homer's method. And it's absolutely logical because I'm showing you these images to show you how easy it is to make graphene oxide in small amounts at lab scale. The method is out there and it works. However, if somebody here has been trying to scale up these um, to even 300 grams, no that this is very difficult actually to do in industrial scale. So basically what you have is the graphite. You go through an oxidation process and you get graphite oxide. And after the elimination and dispersion, there is where you get the single sheets. And here I'm showing you, I must say it's a beautiful term image that shows the amphiphilic nature of the material very well because you have to darken uh, regions which represents the oxidized zones and these lighter regions, which are the non-oxidized uh, oxidized, uh, regions of the material. So two very important reminds, uh, remarks to get from here. Only a few companies worldwide produce kilograms amount with non-disclosed uh, methods, of course. Avalonix is the only one in Europe. The second one is that graphene oxide does not have yet a cast number or it is not re uh, rich registered yet. That means that the, the produced volumes are not higher than 10 tons a year, at least in Europe. So this is something that tells us something about the, the industry. So the industry, but what do they require from us to take these materials from the lab to the market? Well, we believe they require reproducible quality, which translates into quality control. A reliable supply, that means many suppliers, not only one. Competitive prices, HAC issues under control, and standard procedures. But okay, quality here, quality there, we hear it all the time. Who defines the quality? Well, the end user. 
By the book, this is a definition. The end user defines the quality of a product. Uh, who is the end user? New and existing clients, our partners, the people we work with. Uh, but they come to us suppliers because this material is quite new. So they don't know, and there is a lot of variety out there. And the language we use is also a little bit confusing. So they come to us and ask. And what we do suppliers is, okay, we need help. From who? Standards organizations, research institutes also, universities, government uh, agencies, and some other experts. So in other words, who defines quality? We, we define quality. We, the people working in the graphene industry, we need to actively participate in the creation of these standards so they fit actually what we're doing, what we're working with. So this is a little bit of what we're doing in Abalonics. Uh, we're uh, working very hard with Graphene Flagship. We are uh, full members of the Standardization Committee with the Norwegian ISO office. We're collaborating as well. And we're working very, ha very hard also in close collaboration with Terence in the Graphene Council to, again, to participate actively in the creation of these standards. Uh, internally in the company, we are developing a, a quality management system with quality assurance and quality control. A few words on quality control. Quality control we, uh, um, requires an integration with the client uh, to determine the critical parameters that the materials need to, um, to have and the methodology of how we are actually going to check this, uh, this criteria. So, uh, very important about quality control. We know that quality control needs to be low cost. So we produce it can keep competitive prices out, out in the market. And it needs to be easy to do. It needs to be continuous because this is, has to be an everyday work for us. So let's keep that in mind. So our strategy at Avalonics Abalon is, uh, is working with our clients and with the partners to become this certified world-class uh, suppliers with standardized product for constant quality, verified accuracy, uh, with a verified ability to supply and with competitive and realistic pricing policy. So now just a closing remarks of what we have said, which is has been a lot. <laughs> Geo has unique properties. It is a very versatile material. The demand out there is growing. And we know that we need a strong network of research institutes, producers, clients, authorities uh, in the graphic field to succeed. And all of us, we need to work towards high quality materials. These will give us market acceptance, which is very much needed right now. So we can find these groundbreaking products out in the market. Thank you very much for the graph to, to Terence, to the Graphing Council, to the Avalonix team, to the EU Commission, to the Research Council of Norway, to the University of Extremadura in Spain, Innovation Norway, and the Graphing flagship. And thank you for listening to me today. Thank you, Stephanie. That was excellent. And it just shows the versatility of this material with the different types of applications from anti-corrosion to um, you know, water filtration, um, the coating of the glass fibers is quite interesting. And there are a whole bunch of points, but we'll get to that in the Q&A um, after we see from Kayo. So Kayo, if you want to pull up your presentation and, um, and, and lead us through and talk to us a little bit about Mito, which works with graphene oxide and, and functionalizes this material, manipulates it uh, so that it can do even other things, um, we'd love to hear from you on that. Thank you, Terrence, for our introduction, and uh, Stephanie, great presentation. Um, I'm kind of glad that you went before ahead of me because it just make my work uh, easier because um, I'm suspect to say, but Avellanix is doing a great job, and we are also uh, in specific working with them, developing uh, the best uh, uh, graphene oxide as a supplier for our additives. So um, I'm Kaya Losardo, Head of Business Development and Mitomaterials, and I'm going to be talking about 
uh, how it's the commercialization of this and why the graphene oxide is such a unique and uh, it has all these adv advantages that we're being we're able to solve problems that are uh, within the industry. So at Mito we make we don't make graphene we source graphene oxide uh, and we manufacture hybrid additives that are versatile and dispose of chemical and physical bonding points that enhance composite materials to the next level. Uh, with our technology, we're able to provide a solution to some of the pain points in the composites industry where uh, our material is uh, delivered as a drop-in solution. Uh, there's no, uh, we don't add or change any part of the manufacturing process. We're really easy to integrate. It's just um, pour into the resin, it's the polymer you're going to use at any method and it reactively disperse. Um, and because we are going such a low concentration, uh, our additives are um, indicated to be used at 0.1% by weight concentration. We do not add weight to the to the final to the system. Also, um, it's uh, safety, just like uh, um, Stephanie said, is a big issue to the industry. And because graphene is such a uh, a new material that everybody is understanding and characterizing and finding its place in the market, um, safety is an issue. So we are not nano size, we're micron size. Um, and I can say we have our flagship additive, it's a functionalized graphene oxide in POS. Um, POS is a poly oligomeric silicious crioxane. Um, where we functionalize both materials to get together to bring uh, with the functionalities of the graphene oxide, we're able to, um, we, we, <clears throat> uh, we're able to create those bonding points and reactive disperse with not, not leaving agglomeration. Um, and the big question like why graphene oxide? Why not graphene? Everyone is obsessed with graphene and, um, so graphene oxide gives us the opportunity and the versatility to be fiber agnostic and goes into any polymer. Um, we do not change the chemical structure of the polymers and we use those functionalities to graft with other known materials in the market. <clears throat> uh, and as we've seen across the industries, issues as durability, lightweight and increase of uh, manufacturing efficiency, uh, those are key points for a new era of the manufacturing and moving materials to another level. So we source, we source the material from people like Stephanie and we put into a patent process to functionalize these materials. And then we add to the polymer and, and fibers. So why add the functionality? So we chose to functionalize it with another known material like I mentioned before uh, to improve. So in fact, it's the biggest market problem that, um, because we're functionalized with, sorry, I missed it, but, uh, we functionalized with POS, we're not agglomerating. We're solving one of the biggest market problem that prohibits additives to being adopted in the market, which is agglomeration and integration. And sometimes it doesn't make it feasible. Um, and here we have a balance, right? The balance is the best representation of what we need to have when dealing with graphene and more specifically graphene oxide. You have to balance the ability to functionalize, disperse and keep the price point. And balancing value and cost with the functionalization by getting the most of the material without disrupting the already existing process and not agglomerating this is go. This is bingo. I like to increase the, the increase of the end product performance on mechanical and thermal aspects. So uh, I think I have a video that will go on. <clears throat> um, Everyone likes the value proposition graphene, but it's costly. But when you integrate and keep the functionality and having the right scale up, you balance the market problem of adopting graphene for enhancement of physical properties. And 
as I mentioned, with ease integration and reactive dispersion, ego can be uh, integrated in resins, but simply using the shear mixer, as I mentioned, as you can see in the video, you just drop it and you apply energy to the system to the polymer and it just reacts to disperse. Uh, as I can see, um, where we are enabling cheaper materials to perform like more uh, expensive ones. So we have a, com a comparison on, we have polyester with 0.1% in a fiberglass panel versus a vinyl ester where we are able to uh, increase the flexure modules by 135%. Also, we have another example um, when you add ego on <clears throat> an epoxy. Here we have an EPON 808 with a 3370 catalyst with carbon fiber at a 0.1% concentration of additive. We're able to <clears throat> increase uh, flexural and uh, fatigue life. And with that, we're, we provide light weighting. Also here, um, another uh, uh, proved that uh, when we used um, <coughs> a hand layup process to build the panels and we applied ultrasonic on these hand layup where we, we created the panels at our customer facility uh, on site and we dispersed with the hand drill mix, we got the, we can check that it's very uniform dispersed with no agglomerations. Um, with that, we, we come to a use case where uh, we can show in these uh, uh, properties without disrupting the manufacturing process or degrading the resin. As we uh, have here to present the actual application we are working with, working with the freight trailers manufacturers where they're replacing steel for composites. And by adding mito, they were able to increase the, proper, the properties of the polyester, which is shown in the graph before which is cheaper material by 135% over the vinyl ester, enabling the transportation industry to reduce 40 to 50% of weight and re, um, reduce the carbon, um, greenhouse carbon emissions by 40% and shedding 18,000 pounds uh, of load on, the, on those trailers. And there, there's the big gold, right? The additives market is a 10 billion market and it's growing. With a mid-long cycle, uh, the process of our evaluation adoption has been increasing day after day. Um, as we find the best fits for our material and we're solving different problems in different industries. Um, saying all that, the graphene oxide and its variations can be easily mixed with different polymers and other materials, enhancing the properties of composites like tensile strength, elasticity, conductivity, and other um, anti-corrosion and or weatherability. Um, <coughs> also, solve, after solving all those mechanical and electrical and thermal properties, we're also solving uh, dispersibility and we're enabling the manufacturer scale as, as, as well as the dosing problem when adding the material in the manufacturing process. <coughs> It's uh, a way that we can um, measure how much the graphene is being adopted by the industries for the number of patents that are being filed every day in the US state and around the globe to see the, how the development of this market and how valuable the graphene is to the industry. And another factor that we were able to achieve with success was the proprietary process we use in our, uh, in our additives. By using these different known molecules in a two or one step process, we functionalize and hybridize the graphene oxide, taking the most advantage of this material and targeting each one of our functionalized to the best application where we in, um, enable that to be developed. And going big means going into big problems as well. Like Stephanie mentioned, uh, the problem with standardization and with the nomenclature and the best um, 
uh, fit and uh, on the uh, on on the regulatory board is for everyone. Um, we are also developing an extensive work uh, with regulatory bodies, the American National Standard Institute and the National Institute for Stand Standardizations and Techniques, allied with ISO and also with the inputs of the Graphene Council and companies like Abalonics and Mito, working on uh, executing extensive this work to develop documents and papers there are uh, key control characteristics on terminology and nomenclature according to the known methods. So I haven't taken all this data and analyzed to, know, to notice patterns. And we have built extensive customer profiles to best penetrate the markets that would benefit from a highly versatile, cost-effective material to allow composites full potential. Uh, with this information, uh, we're able to take one graphene oxide feedstock and attach almost an infinite number of chemical functionalities using one process that can positively affect and, and any poly polymer we see fit. Um, thank you. Um, it was a pleasure to be here and... Excellent, thank you, Kyle. Uh, so we have a number of questions coming from the audience, but I, I wanna make a couple of observations first and, and ask you a couple of questions myself. Um, first of all, on this, this whole issue of standardization, actually a couple of us were on a standards call prior to this webinar this morning, and, uh, and I'll be on a, a standards presentation uh, with one of the working groups tomorrow morning, 6.30 US time, bright and early to talk about um, a framework a classification framework program that the Graphene Council is leading within the Graphene Council, but we're going to then contribute the outputs to the standards bodies. And so if anybody would like to participate in that, what we're doing in that process is mapping all these different types of graphene because you have graphene nanoplatelets, the graphene oxides, reduced materials. And if you see what uh, Mito Materials is doing, is, is making functionalized versions. And so you have many different flavors of this material that can be tuned for your particular application. And we need to work to uh, define those so that the end user community understands the materials they're working with. Um, the other observations I wanna make, um, and, and we've covered this in other presentations, um, there are a couple of things with graphene that are quite particular to this material and make it difficult for adoption. And one of those is dispersion. And so graphene oxide as a material lends itself for dispersion in aqueous solutions and other solvents. And um, when we did a survey just recently, the Graphene Council did a survey at the end of 2020. We had more than 800 participants in that survey. And one of the questions was, you know, what type of graphene material are you working with? And graphene oxide was the most cited material um, that's being worked on in the community, both from production, research, and application side, which is different from a few years ago when we ran the same survey and graphene nanoplatelets were the most, uh, most work with material. So I think it's worth noting, as Stephanie said in your presentation, and, and both of you really, you've seen the demand for graphene oxide accelerating and independently through our survey, we see that as well. Um, I want to ask about one of these interesting um, attributes, and this ca this came up uh, recently as well. Is the is the question of absorption of of uh, humidity or water with graphene oxide, and what you see happening there? You know, with the oxide compounds, um, how important is it with with handling and humidity control, and it, and how do you how do you deal with that? And Stephanie, I don't know if you want to go first, and I'm sure Kayo has it has a question as well, but. What, what are your observations regarding that aspect of the material? Well, as I said, uh, there are changes happening in the in the surface of the of the material after its production. So uh, we in Abalonics, we handle this issue by, first of all, we tell every, all of this, we tell our clients and our partners. And we say, this is our observations. This is what is out there about uh, studies. And these are the changes that we have observed. So, um, Apart from that, we do not ship a uh, material until uh, between one month, depending on the client's needs, to two months of storage. 
So we're sure that the main changes of the material have happened already. After that, it is when we characterize the materials, we show this characterization and then we ship. And yes, under shipping, we do have uh, strips for uh, controlling the humidity. Okay, excellent, thank you. And Kyle, what, what's your what's your experience with this aspect? Uh, yes, so, so far we, uh, our functionalized product and product, the Ego, uh, we have not seen moisture absorption. Of course, we keep it a um, hermetically sealed container and we ship usually if um, no later than 30 to 40 days uh, product, fresh product. Uh, however, we've been seeing uh, our, our shelf life studies are over uh, 60 days, uh, not six months, sorry, okay. over six months and we can, uh, the product is stable. Yeah, and I, and I think there's an obvious um, other aspect here, Stephanie, if, if your geo is put into solvent, right? Cause you can deliver it in an aqueous solution then you know, it's in, a, it's in a different environment already, right? Um, there's a really interesting um, line of interest with GEO because um, as you state, GEO is hydrophilic um, and it's insulative, right? It's not electrically conductive. And we've had a number of queries about, okay, how can we use GEO with its excellent dispersion characteristics, disperse it on a material and then do a reduction to then change it so that it's electrically conductive or change some of the other properties. Can you talk about that? Because um, you know we've had some very specific people who would like to lay this down and then make circuits out of it, you know, like using lasers and, and doing the reduction. So um, talk to us a little bit about using geo for those properties and then the reduction. What do, what do you guys see from the customer end? Well, um, it is not the first time we, we, we heard about this, this application because uh, whenever a client wants graphene, then how do I disperse it? It's always a problem. So they start with geo. Uh, actually, we have done this in, in Avalonics. The glass fiber coating uh, coated uh, are actually for, we started with geo uh, and then we reduce uh, this, um, this coating uh, by uh, thermal, thermal methods. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doubting a little bit here in my answer because <laughs> this, this has been asked from us from partners and so on. So we do have NDAs in place. Yeah, so yeah. I just can give something very general. Uh, we have tried also this in the lab. We have coated some, uh, some surfaces with geo and then um, with the laser, we have reduced these, these surfaces. Uh, the challenge we see is the creation of defects. Uh, um, when you when you reduce the surface with the laser, the heating up uh, happens like this. So you do create some defects on the on the surface. So if we can find a way to sort of control this a little better, then the the conductivity will increase. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Maybe that's a a function of um, how much energy is used. What you know. What spectrum you apply, yeah. duration? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds, it sounds quite promising because it, it could be quite an interesting approach. Um, I'm going to switch up because we have a really wide range of questions, which is not unusual for a material that's so versatile. Um, one of the questions came in, well, I'll, I'll combine two of them. One of our, um, one of our participants wanted, you know, a little bit more detail and, and statistics. So like when we talk about uh, different applications and we talk about improving corrosion resistance or improving strength and flex modulus. And I know Kayo, you had some, you know, specific uh, performance metrics there, but, um, and, and then another question is, you know, what about using geo in cement and concrete applications? We, we've, we've done a lot in the last couple of months as the graphene council working with different entities on uh, cement and concrete. And so I'll share some of the data we have from that. Mm -hmm. is, you know, something on a ratio of 33 grams of graphene for a metric ton of cement. Um, and based on what you can do with the cementitious reduction of material is take something like nine kilos of CO2 out of that. Mm -hmm. So that's great for CO2 reduction. And at the same time, uh, we have multiple reports from various suppliers of um, Impressive strength uh, improvement in the 40 to 45% range, flexural strength improvement of 25 to 30% in cement and concrete, which is pretty significant. 
Um, but but let's talk specifically then. And I, I don't know, Kyle, if you guys have been working with cement and concrete or, or Stephanie, but um, talk about using specifically geo or RGO in cement and concrete and why why you might want to do that. Uh, I, I can say we haven't yet uh, tried. We've got um, maybe a couple of people who were interested and in we kind of started talking, but we, the conversation have not moved further. So I can't, I can't really say much about it from our uh, standpoint. Stephanie. Um, yes, we actually have, uh, sorry. <laughs> what <do> you do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we actually have a project to uh, EM, introduce a uh, geo into uh, sorry rgo into cement but since it is a project there are ndas in place so i cannot i cannot really discuss a lot but to the person who asked this question please drop me an email i will check uh, with the project leader in our organization what i can share with you and i will definitely do excellent sorry <laughs> Terrence. no no that's th this is always the problem with graphene right is because it, it does offer some really significant competitive advantages and much of the development that's going on commercially is under NDA and it's, you know, it's kept as a trade secret. It's not going to be patented. Nobody's going to hear about it. And we have companies um, that are actually members of the graphene council, but they remain anonymous because they don't want people to know they're even working on graphene, right? Because they see the advantage of it and they don't want to tip their hand. But for those of you um, on the call who would like more information, we have a survey report that we did at the end of 2020 that's free to the public. You can get a copy of that. You can contact us. We have a newsletter. We have lots of information. Um, we also do have NDAs with lots of our member companies, but there's much public information we can share. And on the, on the cement and concrete, there, there is a lot of publicly available data about this. Very low percentage, very important improvements. Um, another one with the cement and concrete, and then we'll move to another topic is it's not just the strength attributes. And, and here's, here's an example of why graphene is so interesting. There are often benefits that are discovered that were not expected mm -hmm. um, that are really significant. And with cement and concrete, it's the cure time. We've had people take a cure time from 28 days to seven days for the same strength profile. That's really important if you're on a job site and you want a quick cure. So you get to strength in a much faster time, which means there's a much overall lower cost to running that project because you can move on to the next phase once the concrete has set and it's got it's reached strength. So that was an unintended consequence and we see it all the time. And Kyle, I wanna ask you about thermoplastics in particular because that's a very interesting area. And what you mentioned about the freight and the light weighting and the in the, the the reduction in fuel, which is also reduction in CO2, and the fact that it's a drop-in process, so companies don't have capital improvement, they, they can run their same process. It's basically adding an additive like they do already. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about the thermoplastic space, because um, we work a lot with the American Composites Manufacturers Association, with JEC World, and others that. Um, so far, it looks like graphene can be used in any of the, you know, from peak, nylon, HDPE, any of these, it seems to be quite compatible. And so what, what are you seeing? And, you know, to the extent you can disclose. Um, yes. <laughs> no, of course. That but, was talk to us about the, point. like the, the, the performance metrics people are trying to get to, if it's strength or light weighting. And, and one, one you didn't mention that I'm interested in is impact resistance, especially for the automotive sector. They're very interested in impact resistance of the plastics. Yes. No, that's a, a great point. Because um, uh, we talk about like, thermosets, thermosets, but also we uh, the thermoplastics is, um, it is, like you said, super compatible. We have been already improved within three um, basic plastics, uh, PC, PET, and... Uh, nylon, nylon 6.6 and nylon 6 as well. Um, the integration is the same. We were uh, hoping, we were expecting to have some issues on when you put in a twin bearer extrusion and, and then you compound it. But we've, we, I think I, ha um, I had a slide, but it's okay. Uh, the dispersion and there's no agglomerations, it goes well. Um, yes, automotive industry are looking for impact and also 
uh, for fatigue life sometimes. Um, we have been seeing very, very preliminary results that I can, I can disclose. Uh, yes, there are improvements, there, there is a fit, and it does can go HTTP to PP, mm -hmm. PC, all the P's. Excellent. Excellent. And I think the important thing, I don't know if you can disclose, but the, the load factor, the amount of material added on a, by weight is, is pretty low, right? Yes, it's 0.1% by weight. So it's nothing. It's, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, is, let, I'll let you know, it does turn black. <laughs> it does turn black. Well, that, that's, how, <laughs> that's how Ford Motor started, right? You can have any color you want as long as it's black, but it worked, right? Yeah. Um, but, but here's the important thing with this um, is graphene has the perception that it's prohibitively expensive, right? Like, you know, you're going to have this high cost material and therefore, you know, we're never going to get the economics out of it. But when you're dealing with 0.1% by weight, even a relatively high price material mm -hmm. has a fairly minimal impact on your cost. And when you're talking about a 25, 35, 40% performance improvement, or in the case of thermoplastics, if you can take a less expensive thermoplastic and move it up a grade in performance, now you know, you're actually at a cost advantage, right? Correct. So I, I think that's really important. Um, Stephanie, we have a, a very specific question. It's re regarding the pH value of the of the graphene oxide, and you know what is what is the pH value, and if it's um, you know out of range, is are there ways of modifying the the pH of the material? That's a very specific question, but one that we have. Yeah. Um, well, uh, in Amalonics, we work with different grades of graphene oxide. Uh, because one of the reasons is uh, purity, the other one is exactly pH. Um, the, our basic product, let's call it like that, is acidic, or actually graphene oxide is acidic. So uh, the best way to store it is actually under acidic conditions, or that is our experience at least. Uh, and that of course will give you a pH in dispersion uh, with a loading of 0.1% by weight uh, of three. So uh, from our partners, we hear that they, for their formulations, they need to, to adjust the pH uh, a little bit and it is possible to, to adjust it. Another, another way we store the material, which is more unstable, but it fits for some formulations, is uh, store it on the basic conditions. And those stability studies or result uh, we're going to get now that we're going to sample these, these stability study that I showed you that we're running. One of the storing conditions is basic, uh, actually, because we want to see what happens with the pH. But given a, given a dispersion of um, a 0.1, as I, as I mentioned, we get the pH about 3. Excellent. Excellent. We have a ton of questions. I'm happy to go as long as you guys are willing to, you know, participate here. And I know that we have some of the audience that will drop off, but we'll record this and and, um, and come back because some of these questions are really, really interesting and relevant. So one of them is regarding the recyclability of uh, polymer composites, um, you know, with the graphene in it. Um, you know, I know from our experience in working with some other producers that graphene has been added to plastics that have already been used and are being recycled to improve the performance. But what about materials that have graphene already incorporated in them? Any, any information about recyclability? Kyle, do you have anything on that? Uh, we, we do not have. We had a couple of people, one person we were talking about uh, working on the recycle of plastics and uh, making them um, perform as virgin plastics. Uh, those studies are in the very beginning, uh, but I've we've seen in their papers out there saying confirming that. So we don't have a use case already in our hands that I can talk about it. Yeah, it just it, lo logically, you know. It, the, the amount of material is quite small on a percentage basis. It improves the performance uh, properties. I don't think there's any reason to believe that it would degrade its recyclability. If anything, it would improve it. Yes. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. Even, uh, 
if you get a plastic that's already infused uh, with Mito, um, with ego, uh, the graphene is going to be there. It, it, it won't degrade. It won't deteriorate. It's not going to change uh, when you add the, uh, the extra plastics on top of it. You're yeah. probably going to have it more diluted, not have, but it won't do anything. Yeah, it won't hurt. What I okay. can say on the top, oh, sorry. <laughs> please, please go ahead. What I can say on the topic is that um, the uh, life cycle analysis is part of uh, what you have to complete to reach register a material in Europe. Uh, we are, we have Alonix, we are uh, members of this cons consortium to register GEO. Uh, so this, these studies is, they're very relevant and we, we have a hand on them, definitely. But uh, they're expensive, and we hope we can show you results soon. Excellent, excellent. Um, another question from a different aspect is, if you see differences in the material, um, if you use different methods or processes for drying, so once you've made the geo and you, and you wanna dry it into a material, um, if there are certain, I don't know if there's a, this might be trade secret territory or things that you wanna keep, keep confidential, but, but talk to us a little bit about, you know, kind of that handling. And then if you will, there's another question about the aging of the material where you mentioned there might be some oxidation process or reduction going on depending on the aging. Um, and if there's, I guess it's like a good cheese, you know, is it, is it, is it better to have a fresh, fresh batch of GO or is it, is it better to have an aged uh, GO? Well, well uh, just like with cheese, depends on who, who's eating it. <laughs> so depending on, on what you use it for yeah. but um, uh, the drying yes one of the variables that we see when we produce geo is uh, well first of all is the graphite source the oxidation process and then is the pretreatments and post treatments hmm. um, yes trade secret I cannot really speak about what we do but um Oh, now that's trade secretary. <laughs> yes, it, it does have a lot to do with what, uh, what the material is going to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if I would look at this from a different aspect. And, and this is kind of, I'll, I'll make a broader point here. Um, this kind of highlights the fact that graphene um, is a very versatile material and it also can be manipulated in a lot of different ways, either in the physical processing or chemical processing or the functionalization like amino uh, materials does. So it can be tuned to the application. Most end users do not really want to handle or deal with these aspects. Most end users, consumers prefer the drop in, you know, give me something that I can put into my process that's repeatable and you know, doesn't, doesn't require a whole lot of manipulation on our side. So I think our message has always been to consumers and, we, and the Graphic Council re represents equally producers and end users as well as academics and researchers. But we've always said, it's better to get it in a master batch. It's better to get it in a, in a handleable hand, a way that you can easily handle it. Um, work with a reliable partner so that it's tuned for your application because at the end of the day, you want to use it and move on to other aspects of creating your end use product. Um, so I think that's important. And I know that Avalonics without any hyperbola is one of the longest standing producers and, and most knowledgeable producers of all the intricacies of geo materials and Mito has developed a really interesting process for functionalizing and tuning this material. And so it's a really interesting combination that focuses on the performance, but also this uh, dispersibility, which is a critical success factor for graphene. Um, there's a very specific question. I'm not sure who can answer this one, but how do you get graphene or graphene oxide to plate out on a polymer surface to get improved chemical resistance from a multi-layer film. So basically this is kind of a, you know, a, a coating uh, type application. Um, and, and we didn't even mention it, but uh, graphene is, uh, is also uh, blocking uh, UV light. So if you're looking at protecting uh, some plastics uh, from, from UV degradation, that's another reason uh, people are using uh, um, graphene in their uh, formulations for coatings. But uh, talk about how to 
you know, get this plated out on a polymer surface for chemical resistance. Can, can one of you handle that one? Um, before I handle that one a little bit, uh, I just want to say, yes, I've been, uh, our website is down. We had a DSNS server problem. Sorry for that. If you need to reach out to me at the end or at any time, reach me on LinkedIn, uh, I'll be happy to talk with you. But um, we actually, on that aspect, I can, I, we have an application that's being developed with a client where we're gonna have a powder coating using our additive. And it does increase the chemical and corrosion resistance of um, this. It's, an, it's going to be in a, a metal tube uh, that's heated. And um, because of the heat also, you have problems with cracking and um, delaminating that coating. So I can disclose that it is adheres better with the graphene and uh, it provides also as well corrosion resistance and chemical resistance as well as UV degradation because it's uh, an outside. Yeah, we, we've, we, we have seen other applications like that um, where graphene is really good with this corrosion or this barrier property in very harsh environments, both chemical and temperature. Uh, sensitive environments. That's that's an interesting point. Um, more to the commercial side, and I know um, Abolonics has done a lot recently for expanding capacity. Um, there is a question about pricing. We're not going to talk about pricing in this forum, but I know Abolonics does post prices for material online. So please visit Abolonics's website if you're interested on the pricing. But as in all things graphene, contact the producer directly, talk about the volumes you need and what, and what your requirement is. And then, and then uh, that's the best way to go about that. But where are you guys on volume uh, for production for graphene uh, now? What, what capacity are you up to with uh, Avalonics? Well, um, our current capacity is up to one ton a year. But as I mentioned, we need to be rich registered in order to produce more. So this is why this is one of the priorities that we have on Avalonics now to, to, to get this to get this done together with the, 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 the other uh, consortium members. Uh, so that is our current capacity up okay. to one ton a year. For yeah. RGO, and for RGO, uh, half a ton. Excellent. Um, there are a couple uh, questions about um, characterization and quality control. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's quite interesting because geo, um, and, and you tell me if I have this incorrectly, but you know, basically geo by nature is single layer material, although it's turbostratic, right? It's not plate, it's not ordered. It's a, it's kind of a, a disordered material, but it's, it's primarily single layer material, correct? Yeah. So the, the question is for quality control techniques, you know, people use uh, Raman spectroscopy or use some of the um, SEM or TAM uh, methods for, um, for measuring. What, what, what's the best way or, or what is a common way that you would use to characterize the material and test um, for, for consistency and quality control? Well, that's, that's a very good question because I think here it's important to, to um, uh, to make a to make a differentiation, there is characterization of the material, and then there is quality control. I know that quality control is sort of checking the characteristics of the material. That's the definition, but quality control has to be included as a routine check for us suppliers. And um, and for example, uh, if a client wants to to do some auditing and checking of uh, on the quality of our material, they need to do them as well. So all of this, all of this process makes Raman, BET, TEM methods, in my opinion, is not adequate for when when you speak about quality control. They're very good for characterization, but they're they're not uh, the right fit for quality control. First of all, they are very expensive. They require Expe um, special equipment, so that you, that you as a producer, you would not own. So you would have to outsource it to research institutes or universities. And this in time 
will make the production go slower and the material to increase uh, to increase its price. So I think uh, what we need to ask ourselves is, are we confusing what are very good characterization methodology with what can be a, a realistic quality control yeah. and where we separate and how we do this? So this is this is our job, like everybody, not just yeah. uh, all suppliers. Yeah, yeah I can I can speak as a from a customer center point when we go to people like Ablonix, we want to know like, and we also have to do that ourselves to our customers because we are functionalizing it and 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 providing the additive in a raw powder form. We do have to have our characterization done and see what our product is, but also yes, set those standards and viable uh, methods. Uh, to have a, a, a quality control and have a consistent production and confirm that consistency, that's the quality for us. That's the, where we are gonna set those standards internally and this is our product. And we, once we have achieved that consistency and we can prove that consistency within the known and viable methods, that's what viable also to the market. Because we don't add like, okay, you have like this humongous report you need to do to quality control in order to to characterize as a quality it's not viable right no we see that and actually there was an interesting method it's in one of our other webinars out of the M mg grafeno group out of brazil had a very mm -hmm. interesting technique that they've developed uh, combining um, afm ramen and uh, artificial intelligence actually to do uh, some kind of mass uh, characterization method uh, that was pretty rapid, uh, a much larger sample size, and um, and then it would be relatively inexpensive. And that's something that um, I think deserves more attention. Um, there is a question regarding the electrical conductivity, um, and and so there's a little bit more of a complex question. So if you're if you're putting geo or RGO into a thermoplastic, um, there's a question here that relates to um, the conductivity, but my understanding is, um, you know, you have to get a, a fairly high percentage to start getting percolation to make a material conductive. I, is that is that something, or Stephanie, either of you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, do you really see customers looking at this, maybe for anti-static purposes, but adding adding the graphene to achieve conductivity in a thermoplastic? Um, we are working with RGO for uh, thermal interface materials. So we also have a project in that, and uh, I am not project leader of that uh, particular one. Uh, so uh, I think to give a to give a, a good answer, I would have to contact my my colleague. But uh, so the, for the person dropping this question, contact me. Okay. And Kyle, do you have any comment on that? Uh, Yes, I do know a little bit, uh, not much about it. We do have our edit because we're functionalizing. We've seen that we are not electric conductive. We are insulating. Uh, so we've seen the preliminary results show, show it uh, that we decrease the conductivity. So, so far we're insulating, but again, we're not we're only pure graphene oxide, we're functionalized the graphene oxide with POS. Um, so that's giving us that differentiation on that. That's what I can comment about it. Understood, understood. Well, I know we've gone you know, well over an hour now, um, and I really want to thank you both for your time and your attention um, and providing the information. You know, We could talk all day about this stuff, yeah. Um, you know, there's there's questions about EMI shielding. I invite uh, invite you to contact me directly. We we could talk about that because we've done a lot of work as the Graphene Council looking at EMI shielding and using these materials. Um, you will receive a copy of the presentations and the contact information. And as Kayo said, uh, their their website's down just for the moment, but that's temporary. So I know that um, that'll be back up soon. Um, before we close this off, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's question. We had. So we had quite a lot of questions. Um, Stephanie, do you have any any closing comments you want to share with uh, the audience today? Uh, well, I think I, I just want to say, well, first of all, to you, thank you very much for inviting us. This is this is a very important platform to to discuss these topics and to to 
get actively doing something about about getting these fantastic materials into the market, into having here in my mobile, whatever. We need the participation of everyone. So thank you, Terence, for this platform. My pleasure. Uh, thank you, Terence. Thank you, Stephanie. It was great to have this talk with you. Thank you for the audience. Uh, all those questions were amazing. That's what we like to have these dynamic conversation so we can talk more about it and people can get more educated about it and learn more about it and um, move to the progress with this wonder, amazing material. Fantastic. Well, to everyone who is a member of the Graphene Council, you know we appreciate you and we, you know that we work on your behalf to try to educate and, and bring both buyers and sellers of this material, researchers and users of this material together if you're not a member of the Graphene Council, strongly encourage you to consider joining. We have lots of member benefits. We're working on a whole bunch of things, including standards and the framework process and all sorts of things to help educate people how to unlock the potential of this material and get it into actual products. And um, the point is where Graphene is today, um, we have enough data points. We know that it works. We have Graphene producers that know how to produce it and produce it at volume. We have competitive pricing, especially at the load factors where you can use it to improve your products. The next step is to do proof of concepts and in and, uh, product prototyping and, um, and, mm -hmm. and get it into actual production because uh, we do have forward leaning companies that are using graphene to gain competitive advantage and are going to change uh, many industries from cement and plastics to electronics and sensors and everything in between. So thank you all for participating. We really appreciate you and uh, have a great, uh, a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.